from the Good Shepherd Auditorium in Inwood, New York City. Welcome to Inwood Artworks On Air. It's where you meet the musicians, filmmakers, writers, theater makers, and artists of all stripes who make their home at what we affectionately call Upstate Manhattan. I'm your host, Aaron Sims, and this is Live and Local. It's our podcast dedicated to showcasing the musicians of Upper Manhattan. We talk to them about what they do, and best of all, listen to them perform live in one of our favorite local venues. Today, we are excited to speak with musician and composer James Noyes. Described as, quote, a monumental force of ideas and energy by Saxophone Journal, James has performed with the Long Island Philharmonic, Juilliard Symphony, Argento New Music Project, New York Arts Ensemble, David Amram, Rosemary Clooney, the Doobie Brothers, and many more. His articles are published in the Musical Quarterly, Saxophone Symposium, and Saxophone Today. He is currently completing Elise Hall, La Dame au Saxophone, a biography of the world's first female orchestral saxophonist. James earned a Doctor of Musical Arts degree from Manhattan School of Music and teaches at William Patterson University and Manhattan School of Music pre-college division and as the author of over 50 musical compositions. We are thrilled to have him play for you live today. Ladies and gentlemen, James Noyes.
Well, James, that was wonderful. Thank you so much for being here today. It's great to see you. Yeah, well, it's great to be here, and I'm very grateful for the opportunity. Sure thing. So can you tell us what we just heard and who was playing with you? Okay, well, um, Naoko uh, Aita is uh, uh, my good friend uh, for many years, and she was playing the piano. And uh, the piece we, we played was Schubert's uh, Stenchen, which uh, is... Uh, translated in, in English as Serenade. Uh, it's, a, it's a, you know, one of classical music's greatest hits. And um, you mentioned Elise Hall in the lead up. Uh, that was one of the pieces that Elise Hall performed uh, on the saxophone in the uh, 1890s. And um, I've been researching about her life and uh, coming up with as many different program um, listings that, that uh, indicate what she actually played because there's there's a number of t uh, times where uh, it says that she performed but then you don't know what she did so right. uh, I've come up with a, a nice um, collection of pieces that uh, that she performed and that was one of the pieces uh, that um, she performed early in her career in California and then uh, we'll hear later from a piece that she commissioned Wow very cool um, well I want to get, definitely get into the Elise Hall biography, uh, but first, um, just want to touch base on your kind of like, well, I think we should talk, start with the saxophone itself, actually, because not to go into saxophone 101, <laughs> but, um, but what many people may not know is that historically speaking, the saxophone has only been around for about 175 years, That's right? That's right, yeah. Um, which isn't a long time if you think about, you know, how long the flute and the oboe and the has violin, been, and yeah, violin right. has, has and so and the harp <laughs> and, the, and, and the biggest strings of the harp so and if so just for contextual purposes you know the, the saxophone doesn't have such a large body of work in comparison uh, including when i say large body chamber orchestral um you name it um rock and roll it doesn't have <laughs> much more um available for until the early 20th century is that right, right? yeah that's right um adolf Sachs invented it around 1840 and he fully expected it to be taken in by the orchestra because the 1800s was a time when a lot of new things were happening in the orchestra and orchestras were getting bigger and bigger and bigger and adding more and more instruments and so of course it, it seemed a natural thing he actually devised the saxophone to be a bass instrument because the tuba uh, interestingly enough hadn't been invented yet and so the bass instruments that they had at the time called the serpent and the ophiclide both of which were cumbersome out of tune um, and um, just uh, maybe not the, the most agreeable sound. Uh, so Adolf Sachs set to work on the saxophone to create a bass instrument that sounded good and could be reconciled with both um, the strings uh, in an indoor setting, like in the orchestra, but also he, he thought it would replace things like the bassoon and the, uh, some of the other woodwinds uh, that have a difficult time projecting outside. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it was all great on paper, but, um, you know, Sachs was apparently um, a very disagreeable person. He was also threatening a lot of people's livelihoods by um, making everything in-house. He also angered a lot of people by putting his name on the instrument when, uh, you know, these days we put our name on everything, but he kind of saw the future of branding. He was really the first musical instrument manufacturer to brand uh, his instruments and people said you're you're you know you're stealing here you know these these aren't your instruments that you invented these are instruments that you a adapted and 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 helped to perfect but it wasn't you that created uh, the lineage you right. know uh, and um, uh, so he he you know, unfortunately for the saxophone, um, it did take a while for it to get uh, accepted. And then, of course, uh, the 20th century with blues and jazz uh, mm -hmm. and, and rock and roll, uh, you know, it, it became um, probably the most easily identifiable wind instrument out yeah. there. Well, you're very agreeable, not disagreeable. <laughs> like, like I, so I'm curious, what made you fall in love with the saxophone? Well, um, 
you know, back in fourth grade, uh, the members of the band in, in junior high, I think, came through and played for the, the class. Uh, like every uh, Midwestern uh, school, I, I was kind of shocked when I moved to New York City to, to realize that they don't have that kind of thing here. They don't even have football teams. They don't have band. They yeah. don't have a lot of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So some people played, and the, the saxophone and the trumpet and the drums kind of caught my eyes and ears. And my sister already played the trumpet, so I was like, well, I don't want to do what she's doing. And my mom ruled out the drums. So uh, the saxophone, um, that, was, that was it. And, you know, I remember my, uh, my other sister, uh, so my sister Nancy plays the trumpet. Marge played the clarinet. And so um, I remember she introduced me to her friend in the high school band at the time who played the Barry sax. Uh, Al Braddock was his name. I still remember his name. <laughs> and I remember the instrument. And I'm like... I got to play that instrument one of these days, you know, because it was just so massive, yeah. you know. And so I ended up playing that a lot in uh, junior high and, and in high school. And then I, I got a thrill of a lifetime, really, uh, playing the Barry Sax part in a Tower of Power cover band when I lived in State College, Pennsylvania. I did that for five what? years. Yeah. So I was laying it down. So wild. Yeah. yeah. We called ourselves Funkenstein. <laughs> Awesome. And, it, and it, you know, we uh, we had a great following, and we we you know we we played all the great uh, you know funk horn charts. You know, it was awesome. Tower of Power, can I just say, is such an influence on so many people. <laughs> I, I mean, in our previous podcast, we talked to Annette Aguilar. Mm -hmm. She didn't mention the podcast, but we both spoke earlier too. It was like, you know, she would go and play in Tower of Power. Mm. Well, because uh, she's out from San Francisco, yeah, yeah, right? Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And so, I mean, it's so we, it's it's amazing how Tower of Power has had so many influences yeah, on people. Yeah, and for those listening, if you haven't checked out Tower of Power, you got to do it. Totally, hundred <laughs> percent. So. Um, and so, and also too, another local, because um, you're not just a musician, you're a composer as well. So if you would, uh, would you tell the story of, you were maybe inspired by another local musician to start composing for the saxophone? Because yeah. again, going back to, you know, the square one, there's not a lot of work, uh, not a lot of composition for saxophone. That's right. Well, and, uh, you know, actually... Um to correct the record a little bit, in yeah. terms of classical music, except for the flute, there's more solo uh, repertoire for saxophone than oh. any other uh, instrument in the wind category. So they really admit it from lost time then. They have, yeah. <laughs> well, and you know, let's face it, um, there's a lot of, uh, there's a, a huge history when you, when you come to things like the clarinet or the violin or the piano or the voice. And so you could be, as a performer, you could be uh, performing music from the 17th and 18th and early 19th century for your whole life. You could, you could be choosing repertoire uh, once a week even yeah. and, not, and not bust into the, the modern era. Saxophonists don't have that luxury. Saxophonists also tend to embrace the new and the modern, you know, because we get to play in, in any kind of, uh, of group, you know, yeah. really. And so, Saxophonists and modern composers are na are a natural fit, yeah. um, and you know, uh, recently I had a former student who he was looking for some, uh, you know, he, he wasn't sure of his direction in music. He had just graduated college, and I said, "Hey, I know you're a composer. Uh, we've got a great saxophone sextet at the Manhattan School Pre College. Why don't you write a piece?" Yeah, and he did, and we premiered it. Uh, in November, and um, and uh, it, it's a great piece that I think will definitely get um, uh, you know published and, and performed more. But in terms of my own compositional career, I did compose some jazz tunes when I was living in Pennsylvania. But then um, in uh, the early 2000s, when I was at Our Savior's Atonement Lutheran Church, uh, I noticed that they used a variety of liturgies and. That was a revelation to me. I grew up hearing the same music in church every Sunday for 18 years, you know, the, the same liturgical music. And it was a revelation to me that there were other ones out there. And I thought, you know, I could give a crack at this. And so I remember uh, uh, right around 2005, I was feeling ready. Um, and one of your um, 
uh, well, uh, a, a um, mutual friend of ours, Paul Brantley, was playing at Our Savior's Atonement in the fall of 2005. He was playing cello, and I immediately, as he was playing, I said, you know what, I'm sensing a piece for cello, soprano saxophone, and voice. And I had the people I wanted to play it, and, and I went home and I wrote it. And then we premiered it, I don't know, a few weeks later, and then that got me on a roll of writing. I ended up, I've written three liturgies now for uh, Our Savior's Atonement Lutheran Church, and a number of sort of one-offs, too, that don't uh, belong to a service. And um, it's been a real thrill. And I find that, you know, when I have lyrics or, or words to, to work with, the, the music kind of just comes, flow, really flows, you know. That was my next question. It's yeah. like saying, like, what speaks to you? Do you, do you start a different place? What, what's your entry point? Well, um, strangely enough, um, Edgar Allan Poe. Now, you're going to say, what? <laughs> but Edgar Allan Poe wrote a very influential essay in the, in the 1840s called The Philosophy of Composition, where he goes step by step on how he wrote The Raven. Now, some people think he's sort of tongue-in-cheek here, but um, I think he's dead serious. And uh, this essay became influential over in France. Actually, he became big in France in the late 19th century, much bigger than here. And this philosophy of composition was uh, kind of the thing that a lot of composers, a lot of artists, and creators were uh, talking about. It, uh, I think one historian calls it a virtual catechism for the late 19th century French artists of the time. So I remember uh, telling my father about this and he goes, oh, well then you need to get you need to get the philosophy of composition. So he actually went down to the library and got a photocopy of it and sent it to me here in New York. I read it <laughs> and it's transformed my my understanding of how to compose to make a, you know, a, a long essay uh, uh, succinct, he basically says, you know, if you ask the right questions, the answers are, are forthcoming, you know? And, yeah. and a lot of times when you have lyrics or words, those things conjure up images of, uh, of what to, uh, how, you know, how to paint the text through the colors and the, the timbres of music right. and the rhythms and the melodies. But it's the, isn't the truth though? It's like it's that curiosity that starts it all, and, yeah. and, and 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 not giving up on asking those questions, and knowing like, hey, you know, um, there are other liturgies being written by other people. I'm an other person, you know. I've got a lot of background in in writing, uh, you know, or, or you know, with, uh, music theory and. And um, why, you know, why can't I give it a shot? And right. and they, I have to say, they've been um, very successful, and they've been uh, uh, continually used at the church since 2006. That's amazing. Yeah. Congratulations. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Very good. Um, well, I think we need to stick with, um, you know, we talk about classical work and uh, and literary. Uh, composition. So I, <laughs> I think uh, the biography you're working on about Elise Hall ah. is a perfect transition. Okay, yeah. Um, a, a, so as I'm sure most listeners may be unfamiliar with her, could you give our listeners a bit of insight into what appealed to you about her and what you're trying to say about her with this book? Because you already gave her give them a taste of what she's done, but um, you know, I you know, I, I could just see a parallel though of in creating orchestral works that included the saxophone in a significant way. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, um, Elise Hall. W was a visionary and she was ahead of her time and because she was a woman and because she had ideas that were uh, out of the mainstream um, uh, I think people weren't sure what to make of her and I think then after she died um, her her you know, hearing her story through the, the, the decidedly um, biased male uh, lens, uh, um, uh, she just seemed like a historical curiosity. You know, what was this woman doing? Well, so um, when I was working on my doctorate at the Manhattan School of Music, um, one of my teachers told me that Claude Debussy was one of his heroes, and I thought, well, Debussy wrote a piece for Elise Hall, and so I thought, I need to know about this piece because this guy was going to be on my 
um, my committee, uh, you know, that was going to be um, giving my degree, and so I wanted to investigate this piece. I wasn't sure what I was going to find, but I wasn't anticipating finding anything um, out of the ordinary. But uh, when I started investigating, I started to find out that what was being said in the, in the historical books, in the biographies of Claude Debussy, didn't fit with what I was finding about the music. You know, the, the, uh, the biographers said, you know, Debussy couldn't even bring himself to finish the piece. Um, he didn't, he was having a, it was a disagreeable task. He wasn't enjoying himself. Um, and just all of these um, things sort of lined up. Oh, and then, uh, you know, the, the, interestingly, the manuscript never arrived. She commissioned the piece in 1901, but the piece was never put into shape until after he died, you know? So it's like people came to the conclusion, oh, well, it must not have been a good piece because he didn't get it out there and get it published. But I think he was more, a little, he was more concerned about uh, putting a, a piece out there for saxophone and orchestra, which was, mm -hmm. would have been unusual at the time, and also for this amateur woman, uh, uh, amateur American woman who played saxophone. And I took 10 years and I published uh, an article about Elise Hall and Claude Debussy that corrected the historical record and, and basically said, um, actually, uh, Debussy had a really excited uh, uh, outlook on the piece. Um, he was initially annoyed uh, when, um, you know, well, he took, he was behind in his, in his efforts. And then uh, Elise Hall's friend, George Longy, sort of showed up on Debussy's doorstep unannounced and Debussy hadn't written anything and so he was a little bit agitated and but he in about two months time he he put together a 10 minute, minute piece of music that is one of 22 pieces that Elise Hall commissioned um, she was independently wealthy and so uh, according to my research she had she, she, she was influenced in three, uh, in three areas. One was she wanted to give more opportunities for women in music. At the time, women were not allowed to be professional musicians. Uh, two, she wanted more opportunities for the saxophone in classical music. And as most everybody knows, there's, um, there, there wasn't many then and there's not that many now even. And then the third thing was she wanted more French music to be performed in the, the concert hall. As most people are, are aware, if, if, they, if you ask them to, to name some classical musicians, they'll say Mozart, they'll say Bach, they'll say Beethoven, they'll say Brahms. Where are the French names in all of mm -hmm. that, right? So um, the French were a little bit late getting to symphonic and chamber music. They, they were really into opera. So they, they had focused all of their musical attention in the middle uh, uh, 19th century in opera, even the late 19th century. But she um, was influenced by the, um, the, the National Society of Music that was created in France in 1870. And they said, we want to promote French chamber and orchestral music. And so she seems to have been influenced in those three areas for women's, Women, saxophone, and f French music. She was uh, a, a devoted um, French um, Francophile, you know. And uh, uh, so uh, when it was all said and done, she had commissioned uh, 22 works. And wow. for a long time, these works languished. The only one people really knew about for a long time was Debussy. Wow. That's pretty amazing. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm glad your work is bringing her work to light. Oh man, and, it's uh, yeah, it's really great. She, you know, it, it she it turns out she was uh, leading the way, standing on the shoulders of giants, James Noyes. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm excited, and and that, like I said, that first piece that we played um, was a piece that she chose and performed, and then we'll be performing uh, one piece from a piece that she commissioned uh, oh. and later in the podcast. Very cool. All right, before we get to that though, um, I wanna fast forward from the late 19th century to right here and now. Um, 
you also play contemporary music and you're expanding your repertoire to your new band crowd funk. Yeah, that's um, right. So, uh, which happens to feature some also other Inwood locals in it as well. Can you tell us about the new band and who's in it and what's it all about? Yeah. Well, uh, <clears throat> you know, I, when I got back to, I, I was out of New York for a couple of years. Uh, and then when I returned, I was hungry to play. And uh, a lot of musicians uh, obviously were hungry. Artists and musicians have had, um, you know, a shitty few years. And um, uh, we need to get back out there and, and get playing and get having fun. And the same thing with audiences. People want to get out and, and just enjoy their, uh, you know, enjoy themselves. And so funk music is really... I've been listening to it for 30 years, and I've never fronted a band, but what I like about it is it's entirely participatory. You get, you get the crowd involved right away. You know, like, uh, we're gonna have a funky good time. You know, and that's, that's the words for the song. It's an we're invitation. We're gonna have yeah. a funky good time, you know? And so immediately the crowd feels like they're part of it. You know, classical music, people are worried about, do I clap now? You know, <laughs> am, I, am I dressed okay? True. Uh, oh, I arrived late, I'm not allowed in. Oh, I didn't, there's all these notes I gotta read, I'm not gonna understand it. The social know. decorum to classical music. And the, but jazz music too, there's yeah. a bit of a, you know, it's a listener's music, and sometimes people are like, I don't get it. Mm-hmm. Funk music, you, there's just no way you can't get it. <laughs> it's immediate. Because it'll get you. It'll get you. It's immediate. <laughs> it's, um, it's infectious. It's uh, in a good way. <laughs> and um, it allows people to be who they are. And a lot of times people feel a little reserved about just letting loose. Yeah. You know, and the guys that I asked, you know, uh, Asher Benor uh, and Keith Burton and Ben Dumbald all live in the neighborhood. Uh, and then my uh, good friend, um, Ben, uh, sorry, Bob Sabin from uh, the Manhattan School of Music. Uh, he and I teach there together. Basically, everybody I asked, they, they took like less than 10 seconds to, to, to say yes, because even though they're super busy, they're like, I got to find a way to fit this in because... For my own mental health, I need an opportunity to just let loose. You know, yeah. so it's not just people that need to let loose; the musicians too. And what's great about funk music, you know, classical music takes tons of concentration, and jazz too. I'm not saying funk music doesn't t- take concentration, but you can you can ease off a little bit and feel like there's just not so much pressure because funk music is a lot about repetition, like, mm-hmm. like we were saying, and so. Um, uh, it can be a little loose. So, what's the future for Crowd Funk? Is there an album going to come out? What, what do you What do you What do you want to do with well, it? Well, I mean, uh, you were there. We played our first gig on Wednesday, I did. Uh, I the twenty fifth. Was there? Yeah, and um, and I, the enthusiasm was uh, palpable. And um, I even talked to some people today. They said we're looking forward to the next time you're playing. And um, you know, the fact that we had a big crowd on a night where it was basically pouring down rain the whole time. Um, that really, I think, bodes well. It, you know, it really, I feel like we're serving a need yeah. for the community. And, you know, that's, that's really, it wasn't just putting together the band for me. It was putting the band together for the musicians and for the, and for the, the audience that comes to see us and for the community. Uh, uh, you know, we need, we need opportunities to come out and, and enjoy the neighbors and the neighborhood without having to, you know, we hear it all the time without having to go all the way downtown yeah. and pay, you know, uh, whatever price, you know, for, for a show or, or, you I know, couldn't agree more. Yeah. I, I created a company all about it. Yeah, so exactly. I, I share that with you a hundred percent. And, yeah. and yes, I had a funky good time. <laughs> <laughs> well, James, we look, I look forward to more performances yeah, and we'll try to yeah. figure it out, but, um, you have one more performance to share with us tonight, right? So, uh, yeah. so, so uh, this us? next piece, um, is actually, uh, this is the first time, uh, that it's ever been performed in this fashion, as far as I know. So I was rehearsing this, uh, music for today uh, with Naoko on, on Friday and, she said, you know, uh, this, this piece, Edeal, um, 
by uh, uh, Leon Moreau. Uh, she said, I was surprised you were playing it on alto. It feels like more of a soprano piece. And I said, well, this was written for Elise Hall, and Elise Hall was an alto saxophonist. And, um, uh, but I, when she told me that, I, I said, yeah, I hear what you're saying. And so I went home, and, and she said, I hear a lighter, um, a lighter texture, a lighter tone quality. And I said, well, actually, the, the range is perfect for the soprano saxophone. So even though Elise Hall did not play soprano saxophone, um, this piece lends itself perfectly to the soprano saxophone. And I thought it was a great opportunity to um, showcase the instrument, also showcase a piece that... Um, that Elise Hall commissioned and, and also, uh, you know, sort of demonstrate uh, what it's like working with great artists and musicians. You know, here's, here's Naoko giving me suggestions and I'm saying, yeah, she's got an amazing uh, idea here. I went home and I transcribed it <laughs> and, uh, and uh, literally here in the auditorium was the first time we put it together because uh, I didn't have my soprano with me when I rehearsed with her on wow. Friday, and I didn't have time. We didn't have time between then and now to do it. And um, I think it was a, a, a tremendous success. And I, I think the the soprano's tone quality really is ideal for that uh, for that piece. I think our listeners will agree with yeah. you. Here yeah. we go once more, James Noyce.
Well, there you heard it, folks. A world premiere uh, and uh, or a, a global premiere. <laughs> the arrangement just happened on Friday night. So, and here we are recording recording on a Sunday. So you guys know. Um, so, James, it's been a pleasure speaking with you. Thank you so much for coming in here and sharing your time. And I talent. really appreciate the uh, the invitation, and I'm, I'm grateful for this opportunity. Yeah, you bet. Um, before we say goodbye, where can people go to find out more about you and your work and uh, your book? Well, I my website is jamesnoise.com and that's spelled n-o-y-e-s so you can think like james and then the words no yes uh, dot com and i'm actually actually going to be launching a new website soon so um be on the lookout for that uh, elise hall the book will be out uh next year 2024 she died in 1924 so it'll be the centennial of her of well her, done. Of I like that. Yeah. yeah. So there's a uh, uh, growing interest in, in her, and that, that seems very timely. And then um, the funk band, Crowd Funk, we performed at On Beale Bacht uh, up in Riverdale, and we're um, waiting to hear back, uh, but I, I fully um, uh, expect that we'll uh, get an opportunity to play there again at some point. I have and no so, doubt, and who knows, maybe we'll get you played down here sometime. In yeah, some people have been suggesting some uh, some other places uh, uh, closer to um, in you know in the in uh, yeah. right here. So maybe even I would in, love maybe it. even in here. Yeah, sure. Maybe he, <laughs> maybe in the auditorium here. Yeah, we can have a funky good time. Yeah, funky good time. <laughs> Very cool. Well, get, listeners, uh, you can find uh, the link to James' website in the description of this episode. Okay. Uh, thank you again, James, for being here. Thank and you, Aaron. You betcha. So this is Live and Local. It's uh, our episode here on Inwood Artworks On Air. We meet the musicians writers, uh, theater makers, and artists of all stripes who make their home here in Upper Manhattan. Uh, if you have a moment, please show some love right now by rating and reviewing this podcast on Apple Podcasts. That really does help. Many thanks to Church of the Good Shepherd here in Inwood for hosting us and to Hidesites.com for uptown promotional support. You can support On Air and all of our programming by making a tax-free donation at InwoodArtworks.nyc backslash donate or via Venmo. Be sure to follow us on social media at Inwood Artworks to keep up with all that we do, including the Inwood Film Festival, Filmworks Off Fresco, live concerts, pop-up galleries, and so much more. Inwood Artworks On Air is proud to be supported in part by public funds from the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs in the partnership with City Council. And Inwood Artworks programming is made possible by the New York State Council on the Arts with the support of the Office of the Governor and the New York State Legislature. From the top of Manhattan and the bottom of our hearts, thank you so much for tuning in. This is Aaron Sims for Inland Artworks On Air.